my personal impressions of the summit are that it is really a historical moment. This is a moment for the world to pay close attention to. Why do I say that? Well, I say that because it's amazing to see the leaders of the nations of the world come together over a process of a few years to say, we are naming the existential threats that are affecting all of us and will continue to affect all of us. We look at issues like climate, unfortunately, uh, conflicts that are happening around the world. All these various existential threats that are now playing a role of mitigating against human survival, literally human survival, for now and the future for our children. It is an important framework, in part also because the nation states and the staff of the UN and others, partners throughout the world have said, we are naming this moment together. We are naming not only the existential threats, but what are the opportunities for us to move forward. A framework's purpose is to chart a path, a roadmap. We have that in this pack. The turbulent issues that we all know about in addition to what I've just said about climate and the conflicts, uh, human um, suffering of all manner, hunger and poverty, all these things have an answer. And this pack gives us some direction to do that. I want to applaud the nation leaders, uh, nation state leaders for giving us this gift. Now, listening to some of the leaders the other day when they were actually speaking to the pack, what is important to say is it's not just a framework, it's not just a document that we can read and find our way forward. No, it is a call to action. And I'm so pleased that the nation state leaders said, this is a call to action. This is a collective moment. All of us are affected by the issues named in the pack. All of us know this. Some of us have had, most of us have had the experience around climate, experiences of loved ones affected by hunger and poverty and all the other issues of conflict that are soaring in, in, all, in all over the world. During election seasons, for ex election seasons, for example, even in the United States, so the pact is a call to action. It is not only a document for the shelf. I encourage everyone to take a look at it. No, you may not agree with every point, but there's something in there that will speak to you. We must remember that 2024 and going forward is a very different world from the beginnings of the United Nations. This came up time and time again in the remarks of the leaders on these past two days. They spoke to the fact the world has fundamentally changed. Let me speak to just a couple of those points. One, the continent of Africa was under colonial rule during those times. There was a surge of independence that eventually took place over the following decades since the inception of the United Nations. All of those countries are now independent and have their own mind, their own customs and ways to enter in in a more equitable way into the conversation. The same is true of small island states. We think about the Caribbean, we think about the Pacific. All of these places were under colonial rule at that time. Jim Crow laws for people like myself who were in the, uh, in the United States, children of the enslaved period, under the Jim Crow laws at that time. These are some of the groups that are now in a position to say, we must change. We must find a more equitable way. We think about 1919 when women won the vote, finally won the vote in the United States, for example. So women's disempowerment at the beginning dawn of the beginning of the United Nations, women and girls not having that opportunity to break through that glass ceiling. That's happening right now. We've had women who have been presidents of Malawi, Liberia, and also Ethiopia, and also the vice president of Colombia, and who knows, maybe in the United States, who knows? But we must make more of a pathway for women and girls who were not the primary audience at the beginning of the United Nations. My hope and my prayer is, as we think about this moment, 
that we will be taking seriously, like our General Secretary said, of those who were not there at the beginning and even over the years who now need to be at the center. And I believe the PAC is seeking to address that. We heard speaker and speaker, time after time, male or female, say, these are the groups that must be at the center now. We must change the financial architecture, we must change our approach and find more equitable ways to be a community. Well, here I am going to hopefully be very presidential and say World Council of Churches has always been there. <laughs> we were there at the beginning. Yes, we too, coming out of World War II, had to postpone our organizational uh, focus, and, and so did the United Nations. We've kind of grown up together in some ways. We've always had critical faith distance. That's always been our primary value. But we've also been in dialogue, in conversations with groups like the United Nations. That's not changing. That is continuing, and I'm very glad that our assembly in Karlsruhe, Germany, just a couple years ago, began that process just as the UN was in, the, in this process of moving toward the pact. We, in our own frameworks, with our members said, we need a strategic plan, not just a plan, but a strategic plan to get us to the next assembly. I believe our strategic plan speaks to opportunities to come alongside now, uh, World Council of Churches is always going to have its critical distance. There may be points where we don't fully agree on the approach or the methodologies because we're people of faith. But we very much will be in conversation. That will continue. And I think our strategic plan that's now been adopted that we're well into, even as we approach 1,700 years since the Nicene Council next year, uh, and all of the life and work celebration. I mean, next year, 2025, is going to be a big year. What an amazing period to be able to say, we are familiar with the PAC. We will consider the PAC as we are on our journey together on this planet. The PAC is at the center. It is showing the political will of the nation states. But what I also want to say in this moment, civil society matters. I, I simply can't say that enough. Civil society matters. So not only the World Council of Churches, but all of these various groups that are representing communities, the grassroots. So I really want to appreciate in my remarks, not only what our political leaders are putting forward and the partners that came alongside, but civil society. In the end, if local communities and regions don't own this, then I'm going to be very concerned that the PAC stands a chance of becoming a living document for all of God's people.